Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, we are glad that you're here. Uh, we have plenty of food and water, so at any point, if you want some more refreshments, please um, help yourself. We um, are Texas Health Southlake. I know I just spoke with a few of you, and I think you're very familiar with our hospital and maybe have done some procedures here before, but if you don't know much about who we are, uh, we've been here for 15 years, just celebrated our 15th anniversary last week, so we're very excited. But we are a specialty surgical hospital. Um, we have over 18 um, specialties here. We also have an ER, a 24-7 ER that, that uh, many people don't know about. But um, what we do here, it's our vision to be the premier provider of all the special specialty services that we have to be an organization where employees want to work, physicians want to practice, and patients receive compassionate care. So that's just a little bit about who we are in front of you. We have our physician directory that also lists out all the services that we provide here at the hospital, so please take a look at that. We're so excited to have Dr. Steinke here this evening to talk about the lapidoplasty bunion correction surgery. Um, I had the pleasure of attending the staff presentation that he did for us last week, and it was very enlightening. So I think you're going to learn a lot. Um, and Dr. Steinke, uh, just, he has a wealth of knowledge um, in, in this area. He um, comes, or he uh, is a part of Foot and Ankle Associates of North Texas. He's been with them since 2011. Um, after completing three years of surgical residency, specializing in reconstructive foot and ankle surgery in Madison, Wisconsin. During his residency, he served as chief resident in his final two years of training. Uh, he received specialized training in revision foot and ankle surgery, um, an area of podiatry that focuses on repair of previous surgical complications. Um, as he's going to talk about tonight, he employs a lapidoplasty 3D bunion correction system in his practice, which we're going to learn a lot about this evening. Uh, he is board certified in reconstructive rear foot and ankle surgery, as well as foot surgery by the American Board of Foot and Ankle Surgery. Um, he's got a wife and two kids, um, Aiden and Friendly, and he has also been recognized by his peers for several years as a top doctor in the area in various local magazines. And so we're very excited to have him here tonight. So without further ado, we'll welcome Dr. Steinke to um, teach us about the bunion, uh, lapoplasty bunion correction surgery. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for coming today. Thank you, Jenny, for hosting this event. I'm glad you guys were able to come and brave the impending storm that's coming here. I think you uh, missed a few people because of that, but um, I'm glad you all came. Um, when, we, when we talk about bunion surgery, obviously there's a lot of different ways that this has been corrected over the years. Uh, Lapoplasty is a variation on the previous techniques, and it corrects a lot of the problems that those previous procedures had. And it's a relatively new procedure, it's been around for about three years, but it hadn't really penetrated this market yet. And luckily, the great hospitals like this were able to incorporate this into their options for their patients and make arrangements for that to happen. So with every presentation, there's always disclaimers for everything, we'll have to give you those. I, I'm not a paid consultant for Treese Medical. Uh, they don't compensate me anyway. The only compensation I get is from performing surgeries and, and billing the insurance company as any other surgeon does. But as with any medical treatment, individual results may vary. Uh, there are potential risks, and recovery takes time. Uh, potential risks include, but are not limited to, infection, discomfort from the presence of an implant, loosening of that implant, and loss of correction or non union or malunion, meaning that area where the joints are fused could potentially not heal. Um, only a surgeon can tell you if lapoplasty is right for you, and I, and I emphasize if you talk to another surgeon, and if they say something like this is not for you, the first question should be, do you actually perform this procedure? because some people are not trained in this, so they say that it's not appropriate. Um, the lapoplasty 3D pressure procedure is covered by uh, uh, one or more patents, and that's why it's special. There are no other uh, companies that have anything like this out there. This is the only one. And if you have any more information after you want to see after this, you can go online, go to fixmytoe.com. There's a fantastic patient education video. They really do the best education I've ever seen from a company like this for patients. So when people come to our office and they have a bunion, you know, obviously the first question is, do I need to have surgery? Is this something I should get fixed? And that answer is pretty easy for me to answer for a patient. It's, is this affecting the quality of your life? If the quality of your life is affected, then of course you're a candidate for surgery. If you can't play basketball with your kid or you can't wear your shoe to work and you're limping by the end of the day, 
and obviously it's time to consider bunion surgery at that time. So what's a bunion? So most people will look at their foot and say, I have this bony growth behind my big toe, and you can see this kind of circles that area. Um, and we call it hallux valgus, that's just a medical term. But that is not a bony growth, there's actually much more to that. Uh, the bunion deformity itself does not originate from this location, it originates from the middle of your foot. And you can see on the other films here, or this on picture, excuse me, is that we have a basically a simple drawing of what a foot would look like, and you see the problem where this little circle is. People think this is the problem because that's where they feel the pain, that's where they get the discomfort. But in reality, it's actually occurring in the middle of your foot in an unstable joint called the first tarsal metatarsal joint, or they call it metconeiform joint. There's different names for this. We'll just call it the TMT for, for ease, but this is the source of the deformity. So it is more than a bump, and we're gonna go, that's basically this presentation we'll be focusing on is what is the cause of this? What is the treatment for it? And you can see obviously they come in all shapes and sizes. This bunny on the left may make this person crippled and they can barely walk. And the patient with this second to last one, huge bunny, they may have no pain at all. So obviously that, that limitation to your daily activities is one of the main factors that you use to determine if you need surgery or not. Remember that the reason bunnings hurt is because you walk on them. And obviously women wear tight shoes, um, they wear heels, that's a lot of pressure in that area. And if you have a guy like me, 200 pound man with a bunion, it's gonna hurt, that's 200 pounds every step I walk and every time I push off on that joint. And if I'm gonna do things like go running or do anything more active, play soccer, that's just gonna increase the pressure in that area. So what are the symptoms? So the obvious thing is say it hurts, I mean it's uncomfortable, it's painful, and that pain can be swelling in the area, it can be nerve irritation. We see it all the time, people come to the office and say, my, my big toe is completely numb, I can't feel it there, what's going on doc? And the answer is, well, the bunion's pressing on that nerve and it's causing discomfort. Um, people will even get blisters or sores in that area from rubbing on their shoes. Uh, and obviously, as the bunion enlarges and that toe moves towards the little toes, those little toes can get hammer toes. You can get painful calluses, corns, and even some rare circumstances. If people are having some numbness in their feet from things like diabetes, they can actually get wounds and sores. So again, what are the cause? It's, it's genetic for the most part. I mean, you can get a bunion just because mom and dad built you that way and it was just bad luck, but it is very common to see someone come to the office and say, mom's got a bunion, dad's got a bunion, I got a bunion too, okay? So there's something, there's something you just can't change and that's just who you are. Now with that being said, that mechanical imbalance in that joint was genetic, but if you do things that are gonna cause that to get worse, it will worsen. So if you're gonna wear high heels every day of your life and you already have this genetic instability, it can worsen or if you're gonna play sports and you're pounding on this foot every step that you take, potentially it can make it worse. Certain occupations, so you know, we're in a hospital here, nurses, all the time. I mean, I, if I had a dollar every time a nurse had her bunion hurt to me, I think I'd have quite a bit of money at this point. But the shoes that they wear and the fact they're on their feet all day long, um, reps from surgical companies, you know, and a lot of, lot of people on their feet a lot of hours. Um, athletes, you know, if you're running a lot, you're gonna be pounding on that foot or your flight attendant, where you know, the flight attendant rules have changed a little bit over the years and not forced to wear high heels anymore, but there's still a rule when you walk through that terminal about what kind of shoe you have to wear to do that. Um, ballet dancers kind of goes without saying, that's pretty obvious, but even construction workers, sweaty, hot foot inside of a shoe with a steel toe. And these guys. So, <laughs> this is not the cause of everybody in America, okay? Um, we see lots of men that don't dress like this. Um, I tried it once in college for like two minutes. Uh, I don't wanna talk about it, but it wasn't a fun experience for me either. So this can be a problem, but the beauty with this surgery is if I had tr traditionally fixed the bunion the old way, which we'll describe momentarily, I would tell patients, make this a rarity. I'm worried your bunion can come back again. Um, but with this surgery, where I would never recommend a patient wear this from a purely from pain standpoint, because we stabilize the source of the problem and we fix it, this could be something that a patient could return to if they were a marketer like Jenny here, or someone that required to wear heels for their occupation. So if you have this problem, you come to our office, pretty straightforward, just like any other doctor office, we're gonna get your medical history, we're gonna go through an examination. Um, I think this is kind of a funny picture because the foot's on a table. I don't, we don't put your foot on our tables. Um, we have nice chairs, but, uh, and Pulse is not there. I'm not quite sure what he's doing, but um, we're, gonna feel, we're gonna feel for more than just, is there a bunny? We're gonna see, is the nerve involved? Is the joint unstable? Are you having other deformities? Uh, a big one is, are you even a candidate because you may have blood flow issues and you don't even know it that your pain is because you have poor blood flow or uh, a diabetes can cause pain as well. So we want to make sure that, yes, not that just you have a bunion, but that you're actually a surgical candidate for a bunion. And if you are not, then we're going to talk about ways to see other physicians to potentially optimize you for that procedure.
So again, progressive, they don't go away on their own. So you can't just wish it away. You can't go buy a splint. You can't go buy a funky insert or shoe. That's just not gonna make that go away. So what happens if I don't treat my bunions? So as far as bunions, there can cause arthritis. You have a joint that's out of alignment and that joint's out of alignment, just like a knee out of alignment or a shoulder that's been dislocated. You're gonna have wear and tear within that joint and where it may not cause pain within just a few days over the course of many, many years, you're gonna see that great toe joint becomes arthritic. Um, you also see here that we have a second toe that's sticking up in the air. It's forming a callus in the top. That callus can become a sore or just be painful. If you, if you have an elevated toe, it can make it very difficult to fit in, especially a feminine shoe. Uh, crossover toe, so you know, there's an example at the very end here. I'll show you a patient that I operated on that had something like this that we had to repair in addition to the bunion. There's additional surgeries that you may need. And when you have this crossover toe, you can actually tear the tissue in the bottom of the joint. And then when that condition occurs, there is no conservative cure for that. Can't give you a shop, can't give you a pad. The unfortunate, once that tissue is torn, it has to be repaired surgically. Uh, bone spurs, obviously, at the joint and then the bottom of your foot, you can get ball of foot pain where that, that second toe joint where it, uh, hits the floor or even your great toe. So it can, it can be managed in early stages a little bit. I mean, if you're having pain, you can wear a wider shoe, of course. It's not gonna cure the condition to make it more comfortable for you. Can you wear a pad? Maybe, if your shoes are slippery and they're sliding around, you can help with that. Um, but only surgical correction can address the root cause. I know some, obviously, uh, people, if you get magazines in the mail, you know, once you hit a, you know, um, AARP age, they're gonna start sending these catalogs in your, in your mail with things up like this, okay? I don't think I wanna wear that when I go out in the town. Um, and that's something that they tell you wear at night and then magically the next morning your buttons will be gone. That's not the case. It's just, it's, it's, some people like to stretch is what that does. So they've developed all kinds of pads and things that you can use for this to help with the pain. Unfortunately, a lot of these pads, they're just temporary band-aids. Uh, we do offer some of these in our office. I mean, for our patients that may not be surgical candidates and they just need something like this picture on the right to cushion that bump, that can be helpful. Unfortunately, cushioning the bump in a shoe that's already too tight may just add more stuff in the shoe and cause more pain. Uh, they do have toe spacers for between the big toe and the second toe. If they rub together, that can help with the discomfort as that, with that as well. And then inserts. You can put an insert in your shoe, and if you have a secondary problem because of the bunion, like pain in the bottom of your foot, it can help alleviate some of that pain. Uh, orthotics is something that we talk about for people that opt not to have surgery because it can slow the progression of the deformity, but not all insurances cover custom orthotics, which is an insert made for you for molding your foot that goes inside your shoe. Um, and if they don't cover it, it can be expensive. If they do cover it, it doesn't correct the bunion deformity at all. So again, it's more than a bump. Uh, people look at that and they say, hey doc, just shave that bump off, I'll be great. I'll, I, that's all I need. Uh, that will not address the, the deviation of the toe. It will not address the cause. So five, 10, 15 years down the road, you're looking at another procedure to, to, to solve the same problem. They're caused by an unstable joint. So you see this little, little arrow in the bottom here that's showing you that first tarsal and tarsal joint. This is what allows that, that, that toe to drift over the side. So when you look at an x-ray, this one on the left, that's a normal foot. And then you have that first metatarsal. That first metatarsal right here has these two little round bones underneath. These are called sesamoids. They are just like your kneecap. The difference is you don't walk on your knees, you walk on these tiny little bones. These are like the lima bean shaped bones. They're very small. But when they work in conjunction with each other, they help you to flex your big toe and they bear equal weight. So when you walk in a normal foot, you're not putting too much pressure on those. Here comes the bunion. So the bunion unstable here, that joint widens, and these little guys actually rotate around the bone, and you have one that's being pounded on with every step that you take, and that's those patients that have the pain right in the bottom, not necessarily the side. And the second one just floats around and gets a free ride. So you're taking all that pressure, and you're, you're doubling it on that one bone, and that can cause problems for you as well. 87% of bunions are misaligned in three dimensions. What I mean by that is we look at this, this last film, this is a two dimensional image. And you look at that image and you just think that those two bones did the peace sign and that's the problem. But in reality, that is occurring, but the bone is also potentially elevating upwards in the air. And 87% of the time that bone is rotating. And that's why you see those little bones not sit where they're supposed to. They're there because that bone over time rotated like this. And that rotation is gonna be a problem long term if you don't repair it. 12 times the likelihood of a bunion coming back if the three problem is not addressed. Now, I don't mean that if you have a, a basic bunion where they knock the bump off or they cut the bone and shift it, that in two to three weeks you're gonna have a bunion back. I mean that over time that will potentially increase and worsen and you have a bunion again. 
And that's, so if we see teenagers especially, we're gonna fix that, we wanna fix that money. I don't wanna see that patient 20 years from now with a frown on their face and, a, and an angry look in their eyes saying, why didn't you fix this? Why did they come back? Uh, the actual statistics, if you look at it, we'll, we'll talk about this a little later, about 70% of the time people can have recurrence of their bunion. And not necessarily the whole recurrence, but partial recurrence. With this procedure, with the most recent study, it's, it's 3%. It's very, very low. So like the leading tower of Pisa, with its unstable foundation, your foot is acting the same, same way. It's making that bone drift off to the side. So again, that bone may be elevated. If you look really closely, you can kind of see that the other bones are behind this, this, this great, uh, this first metatarsal in the great toe. This one's elevated. You have to address that when you fix this and you want to maintain that correction. And then finally, this is a great uh, diagram that they've provided from Trees, and there's a great video that explains this, but it's just kind of like your car going out of alignment. If you came to the dealer and you said, my, my tires are wearing on the outside, and his answer was, well, you're out of alignment, let's just replace those tires. I don't think that's a solution. I think you'd be pretty upset by that because you'd be back in that dealer not too long thereafter. So we need to correct the rotation that you see in that metatarsal. So traditional bunion surgery. This is what the way it's been done forever. Um, in the old olden days, I mean, talking 100 years ago, they would just knock the bump off, use the soft tissue, try to pull that toe straight, and it looked good. And it looked good for a while, and then that toe would drift back. With more modern surgery, really the vast majority of bunion surgery is done in this fashion, where they're cutting the bone, and they're shifting it over, and putting two small screws in place. And by doing this, your foot looks pretty good afterwards. You, you know, you have a small scar on the side, just like you would with a lapoplasty surgery. Uh, and you have these two screws that you don't see, you don't even know they're there, and those bones are close to being back underneath, and often there are underneath. The problem is that bone is usually rotated or it's possibly elevated. So again, olden days, let's just knock the bump off. I don't think that's a solution for the Tower of Pisa, Pisa definitely not a solution for the foot. Again, most surgeries, they're done this way, they cut and shift, and they're moving that bone over, screw goes in place, toe looks good, but again, that unstable foundation has not been addressed. So the bump is gone, but that bone is crooked. That's not a good looking bone. That's a band-aid approach. This is not solving your problem. This is just potentially giving you another one down the road. And I, and I will say to be very clear, we do these surgeries still, but on patients with smaller bunions, it depends on the age of the patient. If you're 15 and have a bunion, I don't want it ever to come back again. If you're 85 and you just have a bump there, potentially you can just shift that over and give you the relief that you're looking for because you're not gonna punish that foot like a 16 year old, 16 year old would. And again, foot looks pretty good, looks good afterwards, is it gonna last? And it's kind of like this, it's that lipstick on a pig thing. It looks good for a while. Um, I will say, I, you know, we're not in California, but they did not test cosmetics in this pig, and this is all Photoshop, so if anybody gets upset by that. Um, one in three patients are dissatisfied after traditional two-dimensional bunion surgery. That same picture I just showed you with the two screw, the screws holding that, 33% of people aren't happy, and I really have to emphasize that. And that could be that their, their appearance doesn't look right or the bunion recurred. I don't think if a friend told me, you know, there's a great restaurant in town, they have 66% of the time people love that place. And the third time they hate it, I don't think I'd go to that restaurant. I think I'd move on. And this is that 70%. 70% of bunions return over time. And that's with the traditional approach. So what Lapplasty did when they were developing this product, because they were, they were working on a, this fusion of this joint that I'm going to describe in a minute, has been around since the 1930s when Dr. Lapplasty first described it. The difference is he didn't address the problem in three dimensions, and he also didn't use a different kind of system to reduce that. That made it very standardized for surgeons and makes it perfect every time. And their motto is fix it right the first time, which is, I love that. That's kind of what my dad taught me when I was growing up. It was always, don't do a job if you're not going to do it right the first time. Um, I'm guessing I probably swept a little dirt under a few rungs here and there, and maybe I got caught. So that's, he tried to drill it into me. But it's a new patented procedure. There won't be other companies coming out with this for a long, long time. They've had what they call you know, positive surgeon adoption. Now, surgeons that have used this, it is more uh, step intensive for us as surgeons. It takes a little more time, but the, the outcome is much, much better for our patients. So after one or two surgeries, you'll find, and you can talk to Mark Gonzalez, who's the rep for Trees, uh, afterwards that they're, they're specially trained doctors that do this, and the ones that do have really, there's a few in the country that do every single bunion they do is done this way. They do it any other way. Um, but it does require advanced training. So if I call Teresa, I've never done one before, and I want to use their plate, or let's, for example, call another company and say I want to use your product, they'd say I'll be there tomorrow. They don't care if I've done it before, they're going to bring the product, they're going to put it in someone's body. Teresa will not allow that. You have to have a surgical training for this because of the specialized nature of the product. 
So you have to do this on a, a cadaver first, and then they have a special team actually come the first few that you do to make sure that you don't have any hiccups and then it's done right in the end. So again, it fixes the root cause. It's a 3D correction. And the big one for patients is with this sur surgery, and I'll show you the picture in a moment, is that people walk within days of surgery. That has not been the process in the past. When you fuse a joint like this, patients typically are now walking for four to six weeks. They're in a cast. Um, and because of mobility issues or just the fact that you may have small kids or children or, or responsibilities, it's very difficult to do that. Um, there's minimal time off work. Now, obviously, if you have a foot surgery and you're a police officer and you have to chase, chase perch down the road, we're not going to say go back to your typical job. You can go back with restrictions, elevate your foot. But we see a lot of teachers that go back and they just, they have a little knee screw they, they go on and they're teaching after several weeks and they just make good choices when they're taking breaks to elevate their foot and ice it. So here's an example of the procedure. There's two, there's actually two plates that they use and each has four screws in it and it locks together. Um, the beauty of that is that it's kind of like, the way I describe it to people is if you took a flat metal bar and tried to bend it with your hands, you can do that if it's thin enough. Now if you take two and you create a T, Lou Ferrigno couldn't bend that. Okay, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and we want to say, it's just it's too strong. So having those two plates is much better than one and classically surgeons that would do this procedure, they would use a plate that go on the top, the side, and the bottom, which isn't providing structural integrity that this does, and that's why most of those surgeons will put their patients in casts. So the way, the way this thing works is first you have to address that angle, that one, that, that plane of the formula that's widening. So there's a special clamp they have. This clamp is patented and nobody else can use it. It's very, and it's actually a technique patent to some degree, meaning that they actually have uh, a patent on how you do this. That's rare. Usually it's my implants made out of this or made out of that or made this way. That's what they patent things with. This is patent on the actual technique. So this clamp will reduce the angle and most importantly correct that rotation in that bone to put those two sesamoid bones back in their proper alignment. So you're actually restoring the normal anatomy. And while this clamp is on there, you can make sure that there's no elevation of that bone as well because we take multiple x-rays in the operating room to confirm that. And you have this stable foundation. So you see these two small plates there. They stay in there for life. They're extraordinarily thin. They contour the bone. They're actually much thinner than most of the implants that are out there. And they are not one, one plate by itself would not be very strong. It's the construct that makes it so unique. So here's the difference. You can see you know, on the left side here, looks okay. A little more space between the big toe and the second toe. Um, and you got your close, but again, no correction of that foundation. It's a cut and shift strategy versus a true fusion or correction at that site. And people will ask, well, if you're fusing a joint, that sounds like a bad thing. I like when my joints move. I agree, I want my shoulders, my elbows, my knees, my hips, all those things to move normally. They have very large ranges of motion. This particular joint is only supposed to have about 10 degrees of motion. So you're only supposed to be doing this where these people that have this problem, they're flapping away in the wind and that's uh, causing problems. Also the adjacent joints, the ones that are around that will make up for any lost motion there. And patients that are marathoners or runners or active athletes, they'll go back to doing those activities again. So, just to show you, you look at the corrected foot compared to normal foot, they look pretty much the same, minus some hardware that you'll never know is even there, won't set off the alarms at the airport. So getting back to the activities you enjoy is really the goal of this. We want you to not have to worry about it. I don't want it to tell you after traditional bunion surgery, you always have to wear orthotic when you go for a run. I don't want to say that. I want to say you do whatever you want after this, and you return to some normalcy uh, in your life. So the next question people will ask is obviously, well, I'm having this surgery, how long is it going to take me to recover? And it's the amazing thing about this, again, there's no cast. You're going to walk within days of this surgery. And you'll be in a boot, obviously, and putting heel pressure on your foot. And even in the first three or four days, you can transfer on your heel. You're taking a shower, you want to keep the pressure off that foot. You'll be in that boot for four to six weeks, and then every week you'll do a little bit more activity. Uh, most of my patients, by two weeks, they're putting pretty much full pressure on that, uh, maybe with assistance of crutches if they're having some soreness. But long distance, you can still use a knee scooter really because it just makes you faster. It makes it more efficient for you to get around. Uh, at six weeks, six or eight weeks, most of the time it's six weeks, as long as the patient's healing properly in, in normal fashion, they're gonna move into normal shoes. Um, yes, a normal shoe is an athletic shoe at first, and once you're comfortable with that, then we'll ease into other shoes over time. If, you're, if your goal is to get a high heel, we're looking at three to four months after surgery at the earliest for that, okay? But it doesn't mean you can't get in a lower heel or a wedge, you can ease into those things as well. And obviously every doctor varies. We have Dr. Sickney here and raise his hand and he's one of our surgeons as well. Um, all of our surgeons do this in our practice. There's actually five surgeons um, that do this procedure. And we'll all have different 
protocols based on the way we train, the way we found to test best with our own patients. So at four to six months, you're returning to normal activities. Now, I say four to six months in regards to normal as in doing more high energy, high impact exercises. You will be at four to six weeks getting on a bike, potentially on a rowing machine. You know, these are the things, types of things we do with any surgery after people have a procedure to help them in physical therapy. Um, you do this surgery, is unlike traditional bunding surgery that puts that incision right near the great toe joint and causes a lot of scar tissue there that causes some stiffness. I very seldom will send patients to physical therapy because I'm not affecting the actual joint where the pain is. I'm affecting the one farther back and it's not moving, so we're not worried about stiffness. We're actually, we're actually looking for that. So full recovery, we talked about a year. The scar is healed. Um, when I close these, it's all stitches underneath the skin, uh, called subcuticular stitches. So you're not gonna come to the office and have these stitches picked out. You're not gonna come in in two weeks and say, you know, you want these out because it's just driving you nuts, it's itching. They're all underneath the skin. So a very pretty scar afterwards. Swelling six months to a year. I don't mean your foot's like a football. I just mean that every day it's a little bit better. So at that point, you're having a, a normal looking foot in relation to the other foot. The technology with the two plates is kind of like this uh, analogy here with the, the basketball. I mean, if you, if you put a basketball in my size seven and a half hand, you're gonna knock that out pretty easily. I put two hands on that ball, you're gonna have a lot of trouble trying to knock that out of my hands. And that's the, the improvement upon the classic procedure with one plate or two screws. With that two plates, it's just much stronger. So when you compare the two procedures in the traditional, we call lapis surgery, which is again, it is using that particular joint in the foot, the one you see in the picture there, it's the same procedure minus the two plates and the, and the rotation correction. Uh, with lapis, you no casting. With traditional surgery, you're gonna cast, you're gonna be using crutches, you're gonna be in a scooter, just like you would with this procedure for long distances, but you can walk in your home fairly quickly. Uh, boot for six weeks versus you're off your feet for up to six weeks in a cast. Uh, when I had done the procedure without this plating system, I would do about four weeks. Some surgeons do less, but even when they do let you go back, it's very restrictive. It's not as aggressive as this procedure allows. We actually want you to walk with the surgery. That those two plates allow for just a gentle amount of motion versus a large amount of motion, and that stimulation of a little bit of movement there helps that foot to heal much more quickly. Um, obviously, if you're, if you're walking in a tennis shoe at six weeks when you're having a laparoscopy, you're just getting into a boot at six weeks after a traditional laparoscopy surgery. So it's a substantial improvement upon that, especially getting back to normal activities. So here's some examples of patients that have had surgeries before, just to show you the scar. This first one on the left is at 30 weeks post-op, and you can, you can, the scar itself is right here, that little line. It almost looks like a vessel on the foot. Very thin scar. And this one's just 12 weeks, you can barely see that. There's a little line here as well. And you can tell these aren't like glamour shots, and if you do see like these weight loss ads, and the picture on the left is the person, their hair all disheveled and no makeup. I mean, it's a normal person, normal person, great result. Fungal toenail, unfortunately. We can treat that too in our office. So behind the scenes, this is kind of just wrap up here and I'll show you a few uh, examples of case studies that I've done, is this is where the, the, the product is better than whatever anything else that's out there in my opinion. Uh, they have this correction device here, which I'll show you here. Uh, the correction device reduces the angle and gives you that normal alignment so you're not rotated. And those little round bones, which you can kind of see right here, are back where they're supposed to be. Um, then you're gonna prepare the joint and this is really what really makes the surgery amazing is that typically when people did this surgery without using this kind of plating system, we would take an instrument, a little saw, and we would remove the joint, and we were just eyeballing it, okay? And most of us are very good at that. I mean, when you train, you learn how to do this, but it literally was, it was a finesse thing, and you could take too much or too little, and then you had to do more, and when you start doing those types of things, you end up shortening that first metatarsal bone behind your great toe. And I don't want you to wake up from surgery and your, your big toe is substantially shorter than your second. We want you to leave with less problems, not another one. So this allows you to perfectly cut the opposing surfaces and minimize how much bone you lose. Um, and then finally, obviously, use the fixation that will correct that. So I kind of skipped these. There's nothing wrong with trying to grow a picture of this one. You can't really see much, but, but you can see the, the position in place and how that toe has been straightened. Uh, unlike the old surgeries, we would cut before we straightened it, before we fixated it. So we were kind of guessing. With this system, you straighten it before you even make a cut. So you know you're precisely positioned for the procedure. And here's just showing the completion of that, and that the patient obviously had developed some pain here as well, and they had to shorten that bone. So you position, position first, cut perfectly, and then you put the, the plates on there to stabilize it. So you can see the difference between those two. 
So the way I'll finish up just a few cases that I've had that come to the office. Uh, this is a 30-year-old female. She's got a two-year-old daughter, and she's the primary caregiver for that child, and there's just no way on earth she's going to go into cast. And she had seen another doctor who told her she's going to be casted for six to eight weeks. It's just not going to happen. It just can't happen for her. So the first one, the biggest one for her is this left one. It was really bothering her. The nerve was being irritated, and this joint was obviously out of alignment. So what we did for her is we fixed that. And you can see the plates uh, correcting that and creating a fusion right there for her. Um, and she's very happy, so happy, in fact, that just several weeks ago she decided I want to match set. So we did that first a few weeks ago. And she's walking on that already um, and taking care of her child. Uh, as far as the surgery, you can see the plates, they look a little different. Uh, and the reason for that is we're, with ways are designed, we're able to bend them to contour your anatomy perfectly. We want to see that intimate contact. And this patient just happens to be about 100 pounds soaking wet. So I don't want her to feel that plate afterwards when she's walking. So this is a great example. I picked this one because this is a nurse. Nurses on their feet a lot. And this is a great example of why you don't wait until you're crippled by a bunion surgery. So you can see that she has an enormous bunion. The sesamoids don't even touch the bottom of her joint. She's starting to develop arthritis. And you'll notice when you look at the little toes, you see a space where she should have a joint. In this case, where is the space? There is none. Because over time, that big toe moved into her second toe push it into the air and cause it actually to sit on top of her second metatarsal. And there is arthritis all through the bottom of that joint. So instead of her having a simple lapoplasty surgery to fix her foot, she had a lapoplasty, she had to shorten this bone, she had to have a hammer toe repair, and that's why you see this temporary pin, which came out about three weeks after surgery. She had to have a tailored bunion done, which potentially could have had to happen either way. But most importantly, she caused this joint to become terribly arthritic and actually tear the tissue in the bottom, which had to be repaired as well. So she went from about one surgery to one, two, three, four, five surgeries pretty quickly. Um, I will say I saw her just recently. This is from about six months ago. She is loving her bunions. Her bunions, she can fit in shoes at work. She's very happy. Uh, I will say her right foot looks just about the same as this one. But because she waited so long, she still feels pain in this joint. And you can see how different that third is to that second. There's a lot of arthritis in that joint. And there's not a procedure that adequately restores the function of that joint. So she's happy, but still sore from that problem. Um, this is one of my favorite patients. Um, she's just a character, but she, I call her the Tom Brady patient because she's from the Northeast, and she told me she had two bunion surgeries on both feet. She had the original you know, cut and shift, and then screw, well actually three technically before that, because she had a cut and shift, two screws went in, didn't correct it, so the surgeon went back, took the screws out, and then later on they did a, a, a second surgery where they used the joint here. Um, this is a classic way, I've done it this way as well for years and it gets good correction, but the surgeon failed and did not reduce the angle adequately. And you can see how the bones are still out of alignment. And when they realized they had failed, instead of saying, well, maybe I should pull those screws out and try again, they decided just to try to straighten the toe here. And again, they failed. Um, in addition to that, you can see how short that first bone is compared to the second. So when she came to the office, she was complaining a lot of pain underneath that second toe. So that again, bought her more surgeries. I call her the Tom Brady patient, not just because she's from the Northeast, because she said the surgeon that did these surgeries told her that Tom Brady's surgeon did her operation. And I've never heard Tom Brady had bunning surgery before, um, maybe a shoulder or something like that, but uh, obviously they weren't skilled in this procedure. And you can see on the right side, there's something wrong with these screws, they're broken. It didn't fuse, it was too unstable. So afterwards, uh, because of that, that gap that, that's been created here, I have to put a graft in this area and I'll harvest a graft from the patient that's always the best for the patient to take a live bone from them to, to make a graft. But the goal is to get the toe straight as possible, lengthen the bone, and then shorten this one so she doesn't feel that pain anymore. So we had to harvest bone. You can see from back, the back of the heel, she has this kind of bump there. It's actually birds a little natural, it's a little large. But we had to take that bone from there. She'll never miss it. In fact, we do a surgery just like that for that problem for people that complain of pain there. And I use that bone to graft in that space. So you can see in this picture, even her big toe is sticking up in the air to some degree. So when it's all said and done, we can't, unfortunately, when you have two bunion surgeries before, you can't completely reduce these sesamoids. But you get them close, okay? In this case, she has a nice straight border, straight toe, fused joint, and you can see the length pattern compared to these two, how different and drastically we've changed that. So now when she walks, she bears weight more equally in the bottom of her foot. And again, that toe, that second toe was nice and straight for her. So she's very happy. Uh, next surgery plan for later this year. 
So that's our presentation today. I want to thank you all for coming today. I know that I can see the lightning outside coming. It's kind of scary and ominous, so we'll get you out here quickly. But uh, with that being said, if there's any questions that you have, we'll open to Q&A Q &A in a second here. Um, if you have questions, you'd rather ask on the side. I'll stay here for a while as well. If you'd like to schedule an appointment, Edith is here. She can do that for you today. Um, I know some people with the year getting closer were very busy in surgery, and that schedule's filling up. So even if you wanted to pencil yourself in before your appointment, we can do that as well. But I do, I would like to thank uh, Texas Health Harris Method of South Lake. That's hard for me to say, I just say South Lake. This is the only place I come in the city. It's the place I want to go. So, but I want to thank Jenny Lanier for, for setting this up and I appreciate you all coming today. Thank you.